thanks so much for coming. And thanks, this is uh, Sterling Coffee. Uh, so he's offered to give us an overview of ham radio. Uh, Sterling's been doing ham for 20 years? Just about 14. Or actually, i got to renew my license next year. So it's official. I've, I've had this license for just about 10 years. So yeah, so for quite a long time. Um, yeah. I know at least you used to work in communications at work as well. So yep. very much involved in communications technology. So uh, thank you for uh, offering to teach yeah. the class. And thank you for the yeah. offer. He you. also happens to be Lori's son. So be nice to him. Who all that? Or you will definitely pay. don't. She's used to that. Though. <laughs> yeah. Well, appreciate the introduction. Like I said, I'm a ham radio guy. Um, who else has a license <coughs> in the class or class? Um, anybody else with a ham radio license? Most of you won't. That's perfect. This isn't going to be an in-depth technical thing. I'm just going to kind of overview what ham radio is, how it compares to CB radio, FRS, GMRS, etc., and kind of show off the gear and the kind of background cool features of ham radio. And maybe it might even become a side hobby um, because from what I found, there's a huge overlap between with doing what I found doing this program or this um, uh, thing. Also, hit record on the on the GoPro. <laughs> it's that time I'm gonna record this and put it on YouTube. Oh, I'll send up the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, the yeah. Yeah. PowerPoint. Send the link to me. I'll come back there. Yeah. All right. So I started the stream. Anyway, yeah. Um, so this will be a high overview, uh, high end overview. Um, and uh, what I was just saying is that there are, there's a huge overlap between ham radio operators and Jeep. Operators. I don't know what you call it, Jeepers or, or Jeep enthusiasts. Um, I'm obviously not a Jeep enthusiast, so that's why I'm here to kind of connect the two. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> All right, so ham radio is really fun. Ham radio is really good in emergencies. Ham radio is better in every way, well, most ways. And then CB radio, and it's not broadcasting music or talk radio, and it's not uh, as nerdy as you think. Like I said, you don't have to like study electrical engineering. You don't have to like know Ohm's law. You don't have to know exactly what frequency is what and this and that. There are things you have to do before you get a license and things you have to know, but it's very easy. And I'll talk about that here in a bit. I have a few pictures to kind of show what ham radio is. This is a guy in Minnesota who has this huge ham radio station with, with a mixer and a really expensive mic and, and this like table like all inlaid and it's really beautiful. Um, if anybody watched Last Man Standing, this is Tim Allen with his fake son uh, with a real ham radio station that they actually set up in, in, the, in the studio on Last Man Standing. I think that show is canceled now, but it went on for like, I don't know, four or five or six years. Um, and it really brought ham radio into like the forefront. This is, I forget the astronaut's name, but this is an astronaut on the ISS talking to a, through a ham radio to a bunch of kids at a school. Um, they do this really frequently to talk, um, to connect schools and the ISS through this archaic means of communication, which, believe it or not, is actually still very common and popular. Now, this is also ham radio. Um, you'll probably recognize this. I like that route. You'll see, this is not a CB antenna. This is for HF. This is for like 10 megahertz, 7 megahertz and below. Over here is this tiny little thing. That's the CB antenna. <laughs> okay. And, um... Here's another ham, who's also a Jeep guy. He's got two antennas there. Um, and his call sign stuck on his bumper. Here's another, a Jeep Rubicon with a bunch of antennas on top, a CD antenna up there. So there's a lot. I, I could have had even more, more pictures, but there's a lot of Googling just Jeep and ham radio. I found like tons and tons of pictures like that, and I actually posted on, on Reddit, like, I'm doing a Jeep presentation or a ham radio presentation to a Jeep club, Give me your pictures, give me your thoughts. And they were like, here you go, tons of people. So what does ham radio have to do with jeeping? It's longer range, and it's clearer than CB radio, CB uh, and FRS. CB radio is pretty common because you can just go to the I don't know, Flying J, go pick up a CB radio and install it really easily. It's pretty cheap, but you're also dealing with truckers and broadcasters and all this other noise that comes in over the radio and you have to squelch it out and often it'll like come open, wide open in the middle of the summer when skip's really hot and you can hear some random dude in Georgia, you know, blaring 5.9 over whatever. Um, but with VHF and UHF FM comms, like this is like a walkie-talkie, so it's um, much more clear and you get a lot more power 
um, a lot more bang for your buck, if you will, out of, uh, out of ham radio. Ham radio has this huge network of repeaters, and what they do is they send your signal for a wide area. You transmit from a little walkie-talkie or your mobile unit in your Jeep, and you can get picked up by a repeater on a hill and retransmits it over a really wide area. Um, cheap handhelds and mobile radios work together. In the CB world, they do have handheld radios. For example, imagine like you're trying to pull, like coordinate pulling somebody out of a ditch or from flip, flipped upside down. You want to tell them, like, turn right, turn left, and you're kind of far away. You can't yell at them or the engine noise is over, you know, overbearing. Not many people have, you know, um, CB radio handhelds to talk to the guy in the Jeep. Um, so this is a perfect way to, to fix that issue. Um, because the mobile rig and the, you know, um, and the uh, walkie-talkie will work just fine together. There's other awesome, really cool things like APRS. I'll have a little demonstration on that. And then fun side activities, HF radio and, and summits on the air. I could have even gone further, but I didn't want to keep this too long. There's a lot of, like, really cool things that you can do in ham radio that's for ham radio. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Any questions so far? Am I, like, going down the right path? So... I'll go through this equipment right here. Handheld units. This is the easiest way to get in the ham radio. This is $25 on Amazon. It has about the same range as one of those walkie-talkies you buy from Walmart, mainly because the antenna is pretty poor. It's rubber. It's not very, you know, efficient. And you can, you, but the bonus with this is you can take these antennas off, put in a coax, and then put, put an antenna on your roof or something or on your you know, roll bars, roll cage to... Um, get better range out of it. These are 5 watts instead of half a watt that a FRS radio can put out and 4 watts that a CB radio can put out. Um, this radio in particular is really hard to program. I got used to it, so I'm sure you can too. Like I said, you can put this to a, a speaker, a new, uh, a better antenna, such as this right here. This is a whip antenna. It's a mag mount, so it might not work for a lot, but you can um, imagine putting this on a, on a mount that mounts to your like, brake light or to your, to your roll bars. And then, uh, you know, here's a longer antenna, a little more rigid, so I don't know if you flip over it might break, but, you know, this one's very bendy. But this will get much longer range. I've had this antenna paired with this radio, I could talk for 60 miles. Easy. Um, and I kind of have an upgraded version. This was 150. I think I got this for 140 off of eBay. It's an FT60. It's very heavy. It's it's, a, um, it's built like a brick, a little more power, a little bit better antenna, much easier to program. And with both of these radios, you can get like an external speaker, have the radio kind of like off to the side or on the grill or something, and just be able to like pull up the speaker and talk into it without having to like hold the radio and dangle cable around. And on the handhelds, you don't need also uh, um, something like the stationary ones, right? You don't need that to circuit, do you? Right. No, you don't need anything but, but what's here. You know, and you need charger, obviously. But, um, yeah, that's pretty true. Now, mobile units, they get more expensive, obviously, because they're much nicer, but you get like 50 watts out of it, and that'll carry your signal over a very long range. Um, this one right here, I think it was $400. It has a detachable faceplate, so this comes off. You can put this anywhere with a cable up on top, in the back you put the radio unit under the seat or anywhere, uh, and then you can extend the microphone, just like a CB radio. Um, there's other radios that are integrated units. Um, I had a picture right here, I'll go back and forth. There's one that's just a full unit and the CD right under it. Um, there's some GPS. Um, and then, um, I talked about the antenna already, and I'll talk about this APRS thing, but you can even go super high-end where you have radios that have built-in, basically, location transmitters, and if any if any of your other friends have another radio like this, you'll be able to see their location on the screen, and it'll actually interface with uh, GPS units like that, so you can actually see their little you know location as they're traveling along, so you can kind of get an idea of where everybody's at. Um, the antennas, just like I mentioned, this antenna was $23, and then... Taller for more range, but they're more breakable. I know I had to fix like three antennas on your Jeep because just hitting trees caused them to break. So. <laughs> I kept breaking them. Yeah. So, so for those little handhelds, um, do they have more accessories? So I'm thinking I've seen people rock running some of the uh, shops and all running like head units. Like mm -hmm. They got something with a mic. So yeah. Like, if you don't push the talk anymore, it's like voice activated or whatever. So then they they can talk without keep, like, keeping their hands on the mm -hmm. wheel. Yeah, I actually have. I should have brought some 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 uh, 
basically it's just a wire that plugs in, or you can do Bluetooth. Um, there's Bluetooth adapters which you can plug into the side, stick them in, Bluetooth it to a headset, and then you have either voice operator or, or maybe a push to talk on your like wheel or somewhere nearby. From a uh, real world experience, the multiband antennas rubbing against trees and bending over all the time. Sometimes they'll come loose in the sections. Yeah. So you definitely want to keep an eye on that. You want to tell them about the quarter wave. Antenna. Yeah. This this antenna is a quarter wave on two meters VHF, and it also works on 440 or 70 centimeters. So it's also a dual band, but you know it's it's whippy. And they even get thinner. There's 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 actually kind of a subset of um, amateur radio. Um, in terms of emergency communications, like ham radio is used very frequently for in uh, search and rescue, and so you know guys with ruggedized cars and, and trucks will need ruggedized antennas. So there'll be things that are much more bendy, much more, um, um, much less. Like if I do that, I'll kind of like put a bend into it. But these ones will like flip like that. So is it dual? Band that it works for CB and for ham or something? No, when it when it comes to dual band with a with a ham radio, that usually means VHF and UHF. It means I don't know what that means. VHF is 144 megahertz. UHF is 440 megahertz. VHF is just above the FM broadcast band. UHF is about the same band as walkie talk like FRS radios um, that you buy at Walmart. Lower the band, the high, the slightly longer range, the better it can push through trees and foliage and all that stuff. But you go higher and you can get um, better clarity over that, like over shorter ranges. Um, but really, over you know my experiences, I've barely ever saw a difference between them. Except unless you're indoors, there's a real difference indoors, like when you're when you're dealing with VHF and UHF. CB, on the other hand, is kind of like way down below 50 megahertz, it's, it's around 27 megahertz. So you get into these like weird actions with the, like act activities with the ionosphere, bounces off the, um, like you might heard of skip, you might heard like um, truckers from North Carolina complaining about the traffic, even though you're in Missouri. Um, uh, because what happens there is the signal gets bounced between the ionosphere, the atmosphere, and the ground many times. And so you can hear people really far away. On 11 meters or CB radio, it doesn't happen as, as frequent, especially in the winter. So if you go on HF down at 3 megahertz, it works like very reliably. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but yeah, the difference between VHF and UHF is, is almost negligible. You get a lot more range in the UHF because it's higher frequency. You get proportionally more frequencies to pick from, um, as opposed to CB radio, which is just a channel. You only get 40 channels to pick from. Um, in, in ham radio, you get an infinite number of channels to pick from, basically. So this is something to think about, like, if we're going to purchase a radio, how are we going to use it? Mm -hmm. If we're just going to use it for wheeling, off-roading, you know, maybe talking on the cruise ship, then yeah. I don't need maybe dual band, because right. that's probably going to cost a little more, uh -huh. and I'm not really going to use it, so I can pay, I can then narrow down my choices to mm -hmm. something a little more economical. Yeah. However, if I do like tech, like a lot of guys, I like this, <laughs> whether I'm going to use it or not, right? Right. Yeah. And that comes with the exception of, of the $25 radio comes dual band. Um, by, oh, you can buy a two pack of even cheaper radios for a single band, um, but they're really hard to program and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, um, it's, it's very common to find dual band stuff, but you're right. Single band is a little bit cheaper, um, but you got to make sure that you pick the right band so you can talk to everybody. You can't Crosstalk. You have to be in VHF to talk on VHF. You have to be in UHF. You have to be on the same frequency. More commonly, uh, VHF is much more common. So when we talk about repeaters, most repeaters are on VHF, are on two meters or 144 megahertz band. Um, sorry if it's getting too technical, but <laughs> all right. So here's an example where somebody installed an antenna. This is a Browning um, uh, something. It's a, I think it's about forty dollar antenna. And it's just a little like L bracket that mounts right under the under the hood. Um, a lot of other people, if they have a roll cage, will have like a clamp that'll clamp on, or you have like a thing that sticks to your brake light. You know, it's cool and everything. Yeah, those, those mounts. Um, does does the ham radio antenna interfere with the CB antenna? Is there proximity recommendations? I know with CB, is some of the stuff I read. You know, some people believe in mounting it in the back, so you have to do metal mm -hmm. in the front. Some people don't. So that kind of that does 
come into effect in, on, on the higher bands, higher frequencies too. When you put an antenna kind of like behind the vehicle, it will shoot the signal a little bit towards the vehicle. So that's why you see most antennas are in the back. In the real world, I've done like antenna modeling and plotting and stuff, and it's like it's like a difference of I don't know five times different. So it could be it could make out you could make out somebody better in the front than in the back, but it really like it's still the pattern's still mostly circular. You get an omnidirectional pattern around your car. Now what you got to be careful with is mounting them in proximity to metal. So if you had this like down on the bumper or something, and half of the antenna was being obscured by metal, that's going to detune it and change the pattern so that basically you're reflecting all the pattern away from the metal. If I'm the antenna and I'm trying to talk to this person behind me, there's a wall in the way, there's metal in the way. So all my signal is going to point that way, um, but then it's also going to detune. I know in um, CB radio talk, I heard SWR, VISWAR, or whatever, you have to tune the antenna, change the, the, um, the thing. It's not so, so problematic at VHF until you get close to metal. Um, but usually, when you buy an antenna, you shouldn't have to change it for, for VHF, VHF. Different at CB because you have a longer wavelength, you need a bigger antenna. Smaller antennas have a little bit more tolerance with, with how, you, how you manage it. And the, and the radios themselves are built to take care of like high SWR loads, whereas CB radio is a lot cheaper. If you put a high SWR on a CB radio, it'll fry the finals or whatever. Um, and then the two antennas are not going to have not particularly, right, yeah, unless they're super close, but they won't react um, mostly because they're in completely different wavelengths, and so they, you know, they don't interfere with each other too badly. So if you put them on, like, opposite sides of the vehicle, that's fine. If you put them on the same kind of, like, put one, put a CB here and a VHF here, no problem. You really shouldn't see a problem. All right, so repeaters retransmit your signal from a high point or tower. Um... And I brought this dryer for so I might as well draw. Imagine, you know, there's a mountain, and you're with your buddies over here on this thing. And you want to talk to your other buddies over here. Oftentimes there will be a repeater up high on the mountain, and all this, all this is basically you send a signal out on a frequency, and then the repeater catches it, and it sends it out on another frequency, and then it goes right back the other way. And so what you're getting is basically simultaneous has been received from the repeater, and um, your buddy is hearing you as you're talking. So it's almost like invisible, but you have to set up your radio so that you transmit on one frequency, but then you switch, change frequencies to receive on another. Um, Does it automatically do that? Yeah. Like, this radio will automatically know what frequency you're on, and there's a generally, like, there's a gentleman's agreement, or there's a convention that says these frequency bands are four repeaters. So if you change your frequency to that frequency, to that repeater's output frequency, you will, your radio will automatically change to the repeater's input frequency when you transmit, and then change back to the output frequency when you receive. Um, Higher-end radios, right? Okay. Higher-end radios will do that. It's already built into the programming. Mm -hmm. It just automatically it automatically does the offset. Yeah. And we saw some of this when we were in Colorado over this last summer, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the locals were telling us there were a lot of repeaters on the mountaintops. Mm -hmm. They were doing 12 and 14,000 footers. Yeah, and in you Colorado. Know, they're up and down and down and down. Yeah, and then you lose comms with your friends. Yeah. Uh, but because they have the repeaters up on the tops, you can't talk across valleys and across areas. Right. Right. Um, so you get about a 60 mile range. Repeaters can be linked. There's, a, there's, for example, the New Mexico Megalink. Is, I, I lived in New Mexico for eight months, and you could literally be anywhere in New Mexico. You'd be in Pueblo, Colorado, and, which is on the south side of Colorado, and talk to a guy in El Paso, Texas, both pretty close to New Mexico, and they both have range to New Mexico repeaters. And that signal will bounce through a bunch of repeaters until it gets to the, I guess, the other side, all simultaneously. So they get pretty busy because you only have one frequency, basically one channel, all these, the whole state can talk on, but... Especially in an emergency, that's a, that's a really great thing to have. You can contact anybody anywhere. Um, Missouri doesn't really have that all over the place. They have a few parts, like, a, like the Missouri inner tie. You can talk from, like, St. Louis, Kansas City. Um, there's a set of repeaters. I'll go to the next slide. And there's a set of repeaters down here in, like, northern Arkansas. All the red ones are all basically linked up. So if you're here, you can talk to the guy over here. 
um, pretty reliably. Um, and this here is a map of, of repeaters. I just did a pull of one of the repeater databases and put it on Google Maps. And every one of those dots is, re is a repeater, and the circle is basically a 60-mile range, except for some of these that have like a 100-mile range because they're on a super high tower mountain. There's some area up there that doesn't have a repeater because there's just people there. Um, but the benefit is that you can buy a mobile repeater and, or even like have two radios connected together, have one transmit on VHF and the other transmit on UHF or receive on UHF. And so what you're doing is setting up a cross-band repeater. So somebody in the front of the pack transmits on the input, it goes into your little repeater, talks to the other radio and transmits it out on a different frequency so somebody farther away can hear the relayed communication. So mobile repeaters are, are common, and, and on the UHF side, you can actually keep it, make it to where it's very easy to, to interoperate um, with, uh, with single band radios on, on UHF because you have to buy more equipment called a duplexer, which filters, you know, I won't get too much into it, but uh, I have lots of links to so who the keep repeaters it up. Are those like personal? Yeah, um, like Tams, individual me, you, anybody can put a repeater up. Um, Usually it's pretty expensive, so clubs will put up a lot of repeaters. St. Louis, for example, the St. Louis Suburban Radio Club used to be the St. Louis Repeater Club, and all it was was a club that would just put up repeaters. So you can see, like, St. Louis, Kansas City, there's dozens and dozens of repeaters, and those are all basically funded through the club's efforts. Um, generally, in, like, more remote areas, it'll just be some <coughs> ham who's interested in putting on a repeater just because his area doesn't have it. Um, and it's just a, you know, cool thing we do. And they're all free to use. It's not like you have to subscribe or anything. They're always there. And as long as you abide by the rules of saying your call sign every 10 minutes and use the you know, right frequencies and make sure your radio isn't broken and splattering all over the place, then it's good. All right. Now I'm going to talk about APRS because I think it's just really cool. Um, it might be interesting to, to, to some of you. APRS is a basically it transmits your, your location over AMT radio, um, and then it sends it to this website called APRS.fi. It sends it to generally a wide APRS network, um, but it is kind of cool to like, be able to see, like, you know, your friend's here, you're up here, you're going to meet up you know, sooner or later. And this works without cell phone coverage. Um, wherever there's a digipeter, and a digipeter is basically like a repeater, except it retransmits the digital, like, location digitally. Um, specific radio models are usually pretty expensive that do this, but you can buy, um, if you have an Android cell phone, you're lucky because you can buy, or actually you can just buy a cable, literally. You can take, you know, a Monario cable, plug it into your phone, and then plug that into your radio, like so. Not like that. <laughs> but like that. And there you go. Your phone, using APRS Droid, which is an app, will, which takes the GPS, converts it into a little packet, and then sends it out over the radio, acts as the little, it's called terminal node controller. It's a, a thing from the you know, old packet days of computers and stuff. Or, if you don't want to plug it into your radio, the phone into your radio, and you want to use your phone, this thing called a mobile link is a Bluetooth thing that plugs into the radio same as the phone, and it just acts as a wireless link to your, to your phone and the, and the radio. So I don't know if I can get it set up. It's pretty, this phone is, you remember when I got this phone? It's, it's very old, my only Android phone. I can't believe it's still on it. So obviously you don't need cell coverage then, you just need right. a GPS in your phone. Exactly. Um, if you do have cell phone coverage, it'll work. Huh? Can I have an old Android phone that's not, that's no longer has service and uses? Yeah. This is exactly that. GPS, the phone works. You don't have to have cell coverage. Okay. You can remove the SIM card. Right. And the phone still is usable. I feel like you will have to load it. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that's exactly what this phone is. Like, the, this phone's so old, the, the power on button doesn't let me unlock the phone. I have to, like, slam it down. But it doesn't have a SIM card. It does have GPS. and does have Wi-Fi. And it does have Bluetooth. And that's all you need to get everything working. So this cable you can buy for $5 on eBay or you can buy the mobile link for $70. Um, and I think they're going to be coming out with a new version that will work with iPhone because iPhone updated stuff and because the, 
way that the, this talks to the phone is incompatible with iOS, so it's pretty annoying. Um, but the downside to this is the message won't route to the internet, which is this, if it's not in range of DigiPeter, which is like one of these little green stuff like this. That doesn't mean you won't be able to pick it up. Like if you're in a, in a group of a long like chain of people and you want to see like where the location where people are like turning and make sure they're not on the wrong path, etc., you can still see that. And you might need a more expensive radio or you might need to um, keep an eye on your phone because it can receive the messages. Um, you know, but uh, it's kind of a hackish way. Ham radio is like really built upon ham ra or hacking the radio spectrum. So there's no like buy this box and make it, you know, it'll work. You can do that, but, you know, you have to buy a laptop, you have to buy this gear, you have to buy that gear. But if you're into gear, then you know, Bob's your uncle, so. So those, those digi-beaters are much less common than the repeaters. Yeah. In fact, let me go to... Sure. Expensive, this expensive. Not, the digi-beaters? Actually, they're, they're a lot less expensive because they don't have to retransmit at the same time. What they do is they get the packet, this little data stream, and then they retransmit it immediately after. So it just like, it's like a store and then immediately forwards instead of simultaneously doing it. So this is just the St. Louis area. Um, W0MA, that, uh, that green triangle is near where we are. We're kind of between that antenna looking thing and, and the triangle. And this guy, KC0, Q Lemieux, he's, uh, he's driving around transmitting his, uh, transmitting his position over, over APRS. That's getting, if you hover over him, I think I'll show you kind of the, so that's getting picked up by the digipeter. That gets retransmitted out over off the screen to a person's house, which receives it and then ports it to the internet. Um, so if I could get this stupid thing working, I could show you, you know, from here, but I think everything's all messed up. I didn't test this prior, so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. It's all public. Like you, you got to know when you hit transmit, your position's out on the internet. But and then I also want to talk about HF, and then we'll kind of wrap up. HF radio is below 30 megahertz, and this includes the CB radio band. But the lower you go, the more reliable range you can get out of it. Like 14 megahertz, 7 megahertz. You need a big long antenna like that, like that red um, Jeep I showed you at the beginning. But at those frequencies, you can reliably get out. 400, 1,000, 200, 12,000 miles away, depending on the solar conditions, the atmospheric conditions at any one time. Um, and it requires a little bit more expensive gear, but here, for example, is a, is a broken radio I bought um, a while ago. I'm trying to fix it. But uh, it's a hull band, all mode. It has VHF and UHF, so it covers all that. It also has HF built in. It only does 5 watts, but that's all you need. Here's a a mobile type antenna and then I'll go back to that slide to show you like you know kind of what somebody else has done. So this guy has a, a pretty long antenna uh, up here in the front behind the winch is an antenna tuner which will automatically tune the antenna to the band that you need it so instead of like having to move the little stinger whip there's like a much there's an electrical thing behind it um, that uh, that takes care of all the tuning. Um, Let's see, there might be another So does HF. that mean that if I speak, uh, if I'm using UHF or VHF or HF, I need a different antenna for each? Yeah, typically. Now, for VHF, UHF, you can get away with using one antenna, and for HF, you can get away with using another antenna. So you kind of tune in between and suffer a little bit of noise? Yeah, yeah. If you try to do HF on a shorter <laughs> antenna, you'll, you'll get nothing. It's like trying to listen to CB radio on a paper clip. Nothing comes through, but... If you've seen like guys drive around with a like a nine foot whip, that's like the wavelength. That's like the perfect CB radio antenna. And you hear lots of noise and lots of lots of stations. So we compromise by making them shorter and wrapping wire around that fiberglass pole or or, or making a big coil. Um, and these antennas are even more of a compromise, believe it or not, um, because there's a big coil right here that's huge, and then it goes up for like ten feet or nine feet. Um, this one, for although this one can like you can grab the top and kind of pull it down, kind of like a uh, a tank or a Humvee. So yeah, it requires more expensive gear, longer antenna. Um, there are also antennas that are about this long, but they have like this large tuning tube and it goes up and down. It's called a screwdriver antenna, um, and it's uh, they can range from like um, four feet to thirteen feet, 
Um, and it's a little more expensive. I think you can get a whole HF radio set up for around five hundred dollars. It'd be really nice. You can scour eBay and you know get a lot of cheaper stuff, but you know probably for two hundred dollars. But uh, you know. So if I have access to HF, can I talk to a CD? Yes and no. So there are things you can do to your radio, and I won't tell you what they are. To to a radio like this to let it transmit on CB radio. By the way, even though some amateur radios can transmit out of band, out of the box, it's illegal to transmit on non-amateur bands with an amateur radio, including cheap Chinese radios like Beofings, unless it's an emergency. FRS, GMRS, CB, Mirrors, and Part 90 require a radio that is FCC certified for its respective service, which means you need a dedicated radio for each. However, you don't need dedicated radios to listen to other bands. Probably should have mentioned that. You can always receive, but in an emergency, you can transmit on CB radio. This is not always good for the radio because the radio is not designed for it. Um, but you can always tune on HF to the CB radio band and hear what's going on. Um, it's, um, there's, a, there's a thing in amateur radio called the Mars Mod, and it lets radios operate on the military bands because oftentimes we do like an interoperability test. In fact, just last week there was, a, there was a test like this that got national news because everybody thought the government was going to shut the grid down, um, like the National Electric Grid, because, you know, I guess somebody like took it out of context. But um, what we were doing is communicating with military auxiliary radio stations, Mars, which um, relaying like bogus emergency traffic just to test our equipment and drill ourselves for when it does happen, when there is a solar flare or when there's a big earthquake or whatever that knocks down the power grid. Um, and they use normal ham radios and they do a mod to them, it's a very, very simple mod, um, to let them work on CB radio. So you, we should just YouTube them? Yeah. <laughs> Now, for CBs, you got to be on the right channel to talk to your buddy. Here, yeah. You say there's infinite different frequencies. How do you, maybe you have to tell them ahead of time to be on the same frequency? How are you going to talk to them? The, um, them every CB channel has, um, has a frequency. So 19, I know off the top of my head, is 27.185. And then channel 20 is 25 kilohertz more than that. So there's, like, you can go Wikipedia, a table of frequencies, program them into your radio, and then they will show up as channel one, two, three, four, five, four. Okay. Um, but your buddy has to be on the same frequency. Though. Has to be on the same frequency, same channel. If you're using CB, but they they will cooperate. I will I will caveat. CB radio uses usually uses AM amplitude modulation, um, and the most common mode on um, ham radio is single sideband. And some really nice CBs like the 148 GTL or GX, they'll have a single sideband mode. You get 12 watts out of it, you get a little more range out of it, um, but um, you will have to make sure that you're on the same mode as well, or else you won't hear each other that well. You can hear, a, you can hear an AM station on a single sideband receiver, but you can't hear a single sideband station on an AM receiver very well, an AM mode. So you can get on the radio with it? Mm -hmm. and on yeah. Station. And then all ham radios have multi-mode, so you can pick AM, FM, single sideband, Morse code if you wanted to, so... And Morse code is still like a big thing. If uh, that's interesting, so that's why I mentioned this can make for a fun side hobby because I, I realize, after finding all those pictures, there's there's hundreds and thousands of of hams who also really love jeeps. So, and then finally, I'll talk to this ham radio for emergencies when you're out in the middle of nowhere. You don't have cell phone coverage. You don't have a satellite phone or a little spot GPS um, satellite messenger to say. Uh, help, I'm upside down in the ditch and nobody knows where I am. Ham radio can really come in handy. Like I mentioned, the APRS digipeters with the repeaters everywhere, the fact you can get out a lot farther range, um, reliably and instantaneously, even with HF, if you're so inclined, you can get out and message over a very wide area very quickly um, because ham radio is actually very popular, very popular. It, it is it is well listened to. So repeaters will usually have two or three people on them always listening. They're always Some of them are actually ported to the Internet, so some people are listening on the Internet. Um, so it can be really helpful when, you know, shit, it's a fan. No need to license for transmitting in emergencies. So if you have a radio in your trunk and you have a problem, you can get it out and just start yelling SOS. And it's always there when cell and spot doesn't work. And I don't know if any of you have heard of spot, the uh, SPOT, the... The satellite 
thing. You can get the, the little $75 dongle that will talk to the Iridium satellites. You can send like messages over your phone, like you can text your, you know, anybody, but um, you can also hit the SOS button. And that's kind of the most common, you know, emergency communication thing when you don't have cell phone coverage. Um, but that costs $20 a month. And uh, the unit costs seventy-five dollars, so you always have to keep paying it. You don't get like pay as you go or anything. And if you do try to use it in a non-emergency, I think you pay like I mean, if it's like going over your data limit. So there's a lot of stuff to read on here, but I I've talked about all this before. CB radio is noisy. F FRS GMRS is really low really low range. For GMS specifically, you get more power in mobile units and external antennas. But you have to buy, um, you have to get an eighty dollar, buy an eighty dollar license. There's no test with it, um, and it's not very common. Um, just because ham radio is much more interesting to the people who want to do use it, uh, GMRS, and it's even cheaper and easier to get into. I, I I'd imagine because it's more common. MURS is usually limited to handheld radios. You only get five channels, two watts. Um, you can also go for business frequencies. You can buy like 10 frequencies for $300 from the FCC, you get a license, um, you can have mobile radios, you can use surplus equipment. It's really pretty simple to get onto, but again, like it's hard to get all your friends on there because they all have to do the same thing. You can, you can kind of divvy out your license and you can divvy out radios. For example, if you just have a bunch of radios in your you know, back seat, you can say, take this, take this, take this. And they can all operate, you know, they don't need to get the license or anything. And then the spot satellite messenger, like I mentioned. Um, so I don't want to curtail this, like, you need to be on a hand radio because there's a lot of options. And I, obviously, most people here use CB radio, but there's a lot of benefits to be gained out of ham, ham radio. So finally, the catch is that the ham radio requires you to get an FCC license. And that might sound scary with a test, and that might sound scary, but it's so easy this kid can do. She's eight years old, she's in Florida, and she's talking to a satellite with a, with a handheld radio. Um, why do we need a license? It's because we need to avoid interference with our other people on the, on, the, on the frequency spectrum. We need to improve safety because you're dealing with high power, 50 watts. You can get 1,500 watts if you wanted to. And if you touch an antenna at 1,500 watts, it'll hurt. Um, and it also cultivates kind of the science, the art, the maturation of radio technology. And I mean, in the past, cell phones and the internet wouldn't have come about without ham radio. And so getting a license that says, you take a test with, on questions like, what is Ohm's law? What is um, the, this frequency band? Why, do, um, why is VHF longer range than UHF? Why, you know, this and that. It's a very, very simple, multiple choice um, question test. There's a lot of resources to help you. And honestly, if you take a practice test, you'll be surprised how easy it is to reduce, you know, the questions down. It's like a common sense exam, except for some of the math stuff. You might have to, like, divide a number or two. Um, and listening never requires a license. You can always have, you know, a scanner. You can always have your radio in, in there listening. You can get a scanner and listen to anything. So there are three classes. Technician is what I've been talking about this whole time, that gets you on the VHF, UHF, gets you on two meters and 70 centimeters, very easy to test, and it's pretty much all you will need for the basic comm setup. General and extra get you HF privileges, which are the longer range, but they require a little bit harder test, um, more RF safety, more like designing questions, like what's a wavelength, how long should an antenna be at this, what frequency band is here, what mode can you use on this frequency band. So a little bit harder, a little bit more memorization, but Still not terrible, and then the extra is the crazy hard one where you get like little, tiny little bit more spectrum for like a leap in like effort, you know, put into Which it. Which one do you have? I have an extra, because I'm cool. <laughs> but I'm not using ham radio, it's just a little tool. I'm like a contester, I'm an enthusiast, I'm an evangelist, so, you know, I went for the hard one so I can get the rare DX, so I can go talk to this guy in Antarctica on this frequency that only he can use, but generals can't use. So I had to get the extra so I could talk, because it's kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> it's just my thing. So distance, clarity, cool gear, hardware, emergency, fun. That's, that's what ham radio is about. Um, I don't know why this did this. Um, I have a, so that's it. 
here's a bunch of resources. I'll send this like presentation out to Brian, and he can distribute it. I have it on my website. Of this video, most of it on YouTube, um, and uh, here's some more. This is kind of like the resources I put up. So, like, I made a Reddit post. There's a lot of other other fellow Jeepers. Who is that? Like that's a nice. silly thing to say, Jeepers. I don't want to like yeah. insult anybody. Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> uh, sorry for asking that at the end of the presentation. Um, so basically, there's a lot of forums. Four by four ham is a is a real popular forum. Reddit. 30, 40 people came up and said, I have a Jeep and a ham radio set up. Do you want to take a picture? Or do you want me to take a picture? Yeah. Um, a YouTube video on a guy's installation. So um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, antennas don't work in the mud. So keep your antennas out of the dirt. Yeah, that is a bummer. Want to Yeah, sure. Take a look. That's it. Is that if you said hold this? I'm going to try to talk underwater. <laughs> well, Sterling has a lot of good information. A lot of you guys know me, from, except for Aaron. You probably forgot who I am. Bob and Chris Franklin County Jeeps. Um, as Sterling said, these are a great way to get started. <clears throat> you can get these in a dual band, uh, two meter, one, 144 megahertz through 440. Um, great way to get started. They're inexpensive and they don't take up much space. I put one in a cup holder. Range uh, 10 to 15 miles to a repeater. But you got to think where we go in the woods, you know, when you break on a transfer case, you may only get two, three, four, maybe five miles out of it to a repeater if you're lucky. But you're uh, going to have to know. The repeater, um, access codes and everything, PO tones, uh, the offset, which these higher ends, they do the offset for you, but you got to know the input frequency. There's an app for that. So find it before you go. Do you have to have internet for the app? No. Yeah. There, there's an app called Repeater Book, which downloads the entire directory, okay. and then you go offline, and the directory is still there. But you dropped your phone in the mud. When you're crawling up the waterfall, of this. And yeah. <laughs> you, you can't pull up the app, so you can't find a repeater. And we need help right now. So, old school book. They sell a lot of books with all the repeaters. They update them every year to mm -hmm. carry a book in your glove box. Yeah. You know? And even before you go, like look at your look at your route and <clears> see what repeaters are out there. Put them into your radio. They're they're there. And so, for those of you that went to Colorado over this summer, you guys are doing. So no one were going to go off on their own. They didn't right. save this one time. So know your see. repeater inputs before you go out and you need help right now. These radios, really nice, detachable faceplate. You see my setup, have to face plate over the radio. The actual radio mounted underneath the seat. They have cooling fans under on the back side of them. You're going to get a lot of dust in these. Every once in a while, you may have to take it apart. But you got to keep these ham radios dry and keep the dust out of them as much as you can. There's a, there's a handful of them that are like IP67 rated, so they won't have a fan. They're hermetically sealed, but they do get hotter, and so you can't keep your key down for... Like, you know, 10 this, minutes. This right here is a 50 watt radio compared to your 4 watt CB. It's going to generate a lot more heat. So that's why they need the fans on it. The cases are made of aluminum to dissipate the heat a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. But they're still going to get hot to the touch, especially uh, when you're talking a lot. <coughs> but very nice radios. Range on those. Not uncommon to hit a repeater 30 miles away. Again, we're in the woods and everything. Um, maybe looking at five to ten miles, you get a repeater. Um, a lot of talk about repeaters, but in real world, we aren't going to be re using repeaters that often unless we need to. Repeaters, you're on a repeater, a group like us on a repeater, it's going to make some old timers really mad. <laughs> You're, you're burning up our repeater, you know, what if somebody needs it in an emergency use? Our primary use is going to be simplex 
which is from radio to radio. Uh, simplex range on this in the woods, one to two miles. On this one, we may get five miles in the woods. So that that's going to be uh, our primary use of simplex. On uh, simplex, is that like one code you put in, and that's it. Everybody puts in the same code. Well, Sterling talked about the how it was a gentleman's agreement that it's allotted. There's certain parts of the frequency that's allotted for repeater use. There's a certain portion of the frequency that's allotted for simplex use. Uh, different regions may have a 15 kilohertz separation between channels. Other uh, regions may have a 20 kilohertz separation between channels. But 146.520 is a national calling frequency. You can get on there, and if there's somebody in range, they'll, they'll uh, talk to you normally. Yeah, it's all like channel 19. It's like the frequency everybody knows to talk. Now, whether it's a 15 or a 20 kilohertz separation, 146.460 is off of the national frequency, but it still works with both 15 or 20 kilohertz separation, so that should probably be the official, unofficial, off-road frequency for simplex. So just something to think about. Another thing is antennas. Well, as a club, couldn't you, on the, on the allotted frequencies, couldn't the club just pick up what frequency they're going to run? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the entire group has to agree on frequency. So at one point, Sterling, you mentioned the programming, so how does programming affect the frequency? So like on my CD, I can take a dial and change my channels. Mm -hmm. Do I have to program that radio to talk on this one frequency? And if I want to change it, I go back and program it again? Or you can do it a few ways. Typically, there's VFO mode, which you literally punch in 146.520. Change, you could change frequency from that to 146.525 by using like the knob or, or a channel button. Um, but, but that's cumbersome. But that's not programmed, right? Um, so if you just did all decide to change channels to one four six five hundred, you'd punch it in. Um, conversely, there's memory mode, which before you go out on the trip, you thought you um, go and punch in one four six five four zero, and then you contact. save it into the memory list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the downside of that is if you decide, you know, that channel has a lot of noise on it, let's go to another channel. Then you have to go back to VFO mode, punch it in. But then, you know, everybody else does that, so. But you could actually put a frequency in memory and name it JMR mm -hmm. or Midwest Jeep thing or FCJ. You know, you can name it anything that you want. So this you're going on your radio. radio. Not, not, not yeah, radio. they can start like yeah. hundreds, nine hundred. If that's what you want to do. If we're all together, we can sub our JMR one and then hit our memory for FCJ if we're out with them. Yeah. yeah. Or well, if you're the running rest. FCJ at the, at the park, if they're running JMR, you're not going to hear each other. So it's like you call out, but no one's hearing you. Yeah. You have but to if you got it memorized, then you could just switch and be like, hey. There would be no bleed over. You, you wouldn't right. hear any other groups. These so radios, they, they also have scan mode. So if you have a few channels, maybe five, and you put it into scan mode, it will sit through those frequencies 100 times a second. So the second somebody wow. hits the button, you'll be able to hear it and then talk okay. about it. So cool. you can, that's the way to kind of... You'd have to have them all... All, yeah, of, uh, all of, oh yeah, you have to have everybody programmed. You can scan in the VFO mode too, where it just scans the entire frequency range, but that's pretty slow. So you can miss stuff there. I think I figured it out uh, at one time on a 15 kilohertz uh, separation, which is what our region is. Um, I think there was something like 28 different channels that you'd be able to use. Now you go out to Colorado or uh, Oregon, someplace, I don't know, they may have a 20 kilohertz yeah. separation. And just there more. may be a couple less frequencies. But what that does, it keeps from keeps you from hearing somebody on the next frequency. Right. The you separation. Not leaving. Yeah, it's not bleeding over. And you won't hear that guy in like the corner. That guy it just got down. <laughs> you know? A uh, little bit about antennas, as I mentioned. Uh, they like to come apart because they're constantly banging on trees and banging on your windshield and everything. So they like to come loose. Um, mentioned a duplexer. Basically a duplexer is a splitter. It will take 
this dual band radio coax goes out to the duplexer very small you can put that under your C2 and you can run two coaxes off that and run two separate antennas say I wanted to run two meter and a 440 antenna separately it's going to be more efficient so the duplexer is 30 bucks mm -hmm. something like that yeah. it's really inexpensive but problem is you have to find two locations for antennas yeah. and the magnet mounts we're all used to the magnet mounts you know you can do that <laughs> The ham radio mounts are very different. This is called a NMO mount. The coax actually goes up through a hole, and then it you screw a cap on that, and then this screws down on top of it. So that's how they work. They're actually very different. Once you see the one, though, you'll understand. So for those antennas, just like CDs, I'm assuming like grounding is very important. Yes, ground is very important. Critical on an. NMO, so yeah, you want to make sure it's grounded. Yep. Um, you just want a good solid uh, metal surface for the magnet mount. Yeah, Works the same as the itself, as the CD yeah. antennas. It's like a capacitive. You know, so this is very similar to our CBs that we use. Difference is we're on FM frequency modulation, not AM amplitude modulation. So we're not going to get all that static and noise. But the antenna tuning, same thing. You have to have a different meter because we're tuning for a different frequency. Your CV and your CV uh, meters are not going to work for this. Going to have to buy a new meter. But hopefully, should. I mean, you were saying the antennas are fairly well tuned. Yeah. 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 From my so, experience, I would buy an antenna, and it, it works just fine. And and when you have a problem, you call up your ham, and they'll be like, "Here's 15 different things you can." Or, yeah. or we'll come and help. You know. So you're going to have to have a new SWR meter. Oh, or uh, come see me for an antenna. <laughs> you know. Some higher end radios have a SWR built in, a SWR meter built in too. Okay, so if I get one of those, Sterling, you're going to set me up, right? I don't know, Sterling. I have a Christmas. You don't listen to how <laughs> yours is it is. <laughs> <laughs> what about the magnet mount antennas on a painted surface? Touche, huh? You don't want to take the paint off they're fine. Yeah, you just take like them like off and clean them off once in a while. I mean, not that we'd get mud or anything underneath them. Never, but, never. Uh, I put like a while, clean that surface and clean the so, surface that it's not. So, like on an antenna like what you got there, I might have missed it. I'm sorry. Uh, like, how? What kind of range can you get? Well, Singer, it's more. Could you talk? You know, talk across from one end to the other. Yes, definitely. Um, you could probably reach into Springfield. And hit a repeater. Mm -hmm. There are repeaters around. Like we more. ran those. Um, which, what are those? Those eight watt pinouts that we use for like a shutout. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we used them at uh, S'more, and even like we was, you know, back on Rocker Knocker, and mm -hmm. we were having a hard time getting back to camp with it. Sometimes yeah, with it's the like handheld. Yeah, with the handheld. Yeah. Uh, definitely going to be more limited range because of the antenna. Right. Well, I don't. Know, I don't even know what channel they were using or if they was on. But a Sterling uh, set. You can actually take this, get an adapter, and use this antenna on this and extend your range out. These are normally five watts. Um, you really want to extend your range out. Most of these units are fifty watts. So that will definitely get you out there. You're still, uh, you're still limited by line of sight, though, right? If you're down in a, in a valley, like... Yeah, if you've got a mound between you and the guy you're talking to, there, there's... It's not going to skim across the surface at all. Right. right. Yeah. There's almost no way. Now, now, given that, if you're, like, on a real mound where there's, like, a peak, sometimes the signal will do funny things and diffract over the edge, and you'll hear somebody on the other side. So yeah. there, there are weird... And, and, I mean, there was this one day I was sitting in my front yard, and I was talking to this... Topeka, this Kansas State Trooper on this radio. I lived in Warrington. Like that was kind of weird. And what I found out is, at certain times, certain when the weather's right, the signal, even five watts, can go up into the troposphere and find a duct between a high temperature and a low temperature area, and just kind of bounce around there until it fixes itself. And That's why you hear that guy in Florida that just got down. <laughs> That's HF though. Yeah. Definitely more common than HF. Um, but Sterling has a lot of good information.
me being a ham radio operator and a jeeper, I thought maybe, you know, I did a little real world, you know, because you yeah. said you don't have a jeep. But that's my real world experience. Now, as far as licensing, licensing is uh, $15 for 10 years. I mean, it's no big deal. So do you have to take the test again? No, you just renew unless you yeah, forget. Renew. You know, no, I think you get. So it's <coughs> you get a you get a two year grace period after your license lapses before you have to take the test again. If it doesn't, then you just renew. You don't have to pay. I don't think you have to pay extra fifteen dollars afterwards because that's just for your test materials and stuff. You just go. So seriously, to renew, I just go online and say I want to renew. No money, no nothing. They go. Yeah. Pretty much. And one more thing, rugged radios are illegal radios. You ever heard of rugged radios? Rugged radios, huh? Look like up, like a up. like a brand. That is not, not a ham radio. You're huh. taking a Chinese-made ham radio, branding oh. it rugged radios, marking it up 150 yeah. percent, and selling it to unsuspecting customers. It's like it's like putting like a you know a foil thing over this, showing you oh it's really actually this radio, but it's got this on the inside. And what they're doing is they're pirating business bands. Oh, so you would be in trouble. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I don't know how they're still in business. But as far as licensing, you can get a book. Uh, he had the uh, website up there. Uh, a A-A-R-L. Yeah. It's on the event. So I, I linked it on the event. Go to the event page. It's like one of the first things. A-R-R-L.org. American Radio Relay League. Yep. Dot org. Uh, you can get a book on there for a technician class license that's uh, probably going to be all that you're going to need. I'm, I'm a general. I hardly ever use it. I have done some uh, HF. I've taught Europe, Australia, Philippines, all around the world, but Hawaii. So I run a thousand watts. It was fun for a while, but talking to you guys on the trail, that'd be a lot more fun for me. But you can get a book for a technician class. I think they're twenty-five or thirty dollars now. Get the latest and greatest. They have the answers in the back of the book. They almost do this to you, people. <laughs> it's pretty much. What do you guys wait for? It's I already common sense. Ever for a bunch of jeepers to get their ham radio? Come on, kill them. Okay. No one is in the twenty bucks. That would be Bobby's Christmas present. Yeah, yeah. So we all get our ham radio license. Well, what happens, what happens when you use a ham radio? We well, don't have a license. We all know. You draw <laughs> a fake uh, uh, ID See, the call sign. You did on that screen. No, but but Which you'll call sign? in zero SSC. In zero SSC. Yeah. KD zero PDX. What's yours? K L L Y R. <laughs> that, that one sounds a little sketchy. Yeah. Let's look that up. Oh no. There's nobody there. And and the thing with this, it's almost like a That's light bulb. So if you if you keep on throwing out illegal call signs, you can be direction found and, and if you piss off enough people they'll point their antennas at you and you know hunt you down. There's been a couple instances like that. So what the people we can triangulate. Yeah, but I mean, what's the consequence? It's self-enforced. $10,000 fine? If you don't have a license. Yeah. So if you don't want to spend the $25 to go to the event page, I linked a place where you can take those practice tests. It certainly mentioned that. Ham study, yeah. So there's, which one, the second one? The third one. So the third one is the practice test site. The second one is the is where you can get free study guides. So instead of buying a book with the questions, you can get a PDF. And what they do is they look through every question, give you a little bit of information, and then show you the answer based on that, you know, a little information. Then they go on to the next question, and they kind of, like, float through it more. Yeah, the book is a great resource. Don't get me wrong. I think Bobby's right. You should buy the book. Yeah. If, if you really just, like, want to get it done, just go out there and take, like, take this practice test, like, six or eight times, and you will probably cover 90% of the questions. They use yeah. the actual oh, question. I mean, I mean, you just take it over and over and over. I'll tell you, when I set this up, I went out there and took it, and I spent all of five minutes on all that question. <laughs> Because I'm like, what the hell? Let's see how this goes. Yeah. And you got to get. Even uh, thinking about them, I got like a 67. They are giving it to you, people. Come on. Yep. So, so, all right. What do you, what do you, what do you look for? Like? What do you think? And an antennas. So I've got one of those power phone radios that yeah. the range is crap. So I wanted a better antenna. And there's tons of antennas on eBay and Amazon. And, uh, I don't want to look at. So you want a better like antenna like this, like a like a rubber ducky, or do you want something that catches your vehicle? What's the most range? 
The one that attaches to your vehicle. Anything that's outside, sticking up above the metal, real high, that's, that gives you the most range. The antenna that comes with it, though, is is literally a rubber ducky. Like you, you can pull it open, and it's just this little piece of wire that who knows, you know, it's like a paper clip. Um, but you can buy better versions of this, you know, kind of like this antenna here that will that are a little more efficient. I think it'll set you back twenty dollars to get an antenna that's a little bit longer, a little more whippy, um, more durable, and you'll get maybe two, three more miles out of it on a flat kind of like. So like this one gets like, like three or four miles, and that one's gonna get how many? So like Aaron, this one maybe like four, five, five or six. So, and that's it. All depends on the terrain, but if you're like talking from. The front of the pack to the back of the pack. Like, you're basically on the same elevation. You haven't turned around a mountain, so, you know, you can still kind of see each other. Um, better antennas will get through the trees and stuff. And then, of course, like this. Even, even between these two antennas, I did an A-B comparison with a little switch, and I almost found no difference. I could hit repeaters 60 miles away with this one, 50 miles away with this one. I couldn't hear that 60-mile one with, with this one, but I can already hear like two dozen repeaters with this and an extra maybe three or four without them. So So when I'm looking at all the options on yeah. Bay or whatever, what do I how do I narrow it down? Um I would start on Amazon honestly, because the Bay of Thing's so popular and when you go to like a site like Reddit, um is a is a place where a lot of people will ask questions. Um and then get referred to like buy this antenna, but if I just type in Bay of Thing antenna, it'll come up like the first link will be probably one of the let's see first Amazon link that's an original UVR five R that's the one there. antenna upgrade yeah so the UV five R is radio model but like this antenna right here is a perfect upgrade it will it will get you maybe fifty percent better range out of out of using this antenna versus that one so an extra two or three miles that's for the the handheld. Um, Rubber ducky, and then for the for the car one, one of the mounts in your car, this Tram 1180 is 23 dollars. This is what I would recommend. They have an NMO version as well. Um, it's very short. And there's a, and that, that should pretty much narrow it down. But you can you can go in and read more reviews and, and you know go through that. But yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, but that's probably a good starting spot. Right. There's there's. I did buy one like that, but I don't know. Yeah. It plugged into the radio yeah, I was happy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it seemed like it's much better, though. Right. There's the, the diminishing returns are real. Like like I said, between these two antennas, they're not, this antenna's not that much better. <coughs> There's an exception. This antenna is way better than the antenna that comes with this. Now, for like an upgraded radio, um, this antenna, if you buy a, a aftermarket antenna, it won't be. As good as buying one for like one of these, so it'll get you maybe 25% better range, but you know, it's not almost not worth it. So, the real deal is you know, getting something that sticks outside the car, <coughs> unless you just want something in your cup holder that you can pick up whenever somebody's calling at you. So, we had a couple of questions about tests and taking tests. So, um, on the event page, I posted out the link to the St. Louis Ram radio site. Mm -hmm. That's the place down in Festus or South County somewhere. They give, they issue the tests very regularly, which is really nice. So um, my question for the group is, who's all interested, now that we did this, the point of doing this and asking somebody to come in um, was the fact that we get a bunch of people to go and take a test and get their license. You know, it's all well and nice, but let's hmm. see some people fall through. Um, what do you guys think? Are you, are you who's ready to take their license and start yeah, studying for it? I mean, so we could, we could do a couple of things. We could say, let's meet once for a study group, and you study on your own, come to study group, we ask questions, and then we go take a license. Um, or you could say, just screw it, I can memorize 35 questions myself, and I'll go take a license. It's 15 bucks, at least in that location. I don't know if it varies much anywhere. But yeah. um, this is, they offer, I posted up the dates in the event page. So it's like they have three dates in November coming up. Uh, they got two dates in December. So literally by the end of this year, I'd like to see a bunch of, these, bunch of, these, bunch of us that are that at least are our technicians. So Sterling, do you give the test? I am a VE, but I haven't done many testings. There, There's a whole bunch of people in St. Louis that, so that you don't take, take care of I, no, I, I totally no, come in and do that. I just I haven't know. done it before, but I can. I, <coughs> I'm accredited, so I can definitely do it. But the, the problem is you need three... VEs for the test. You have to have three people sign your thing. So 
if you're taking like a real course, you'll have them there. But I think my, my recommendation, first recommendation would be to go to like the SLSRC or the Finn Club or the St. Charles Club and take one of their license exam sessions. They have, there's one like every, every month or twice, two or three times a month. So third thing, I could find two other guys to, to you know, run the exam just in here. And then with that, I think the, the testing materials would be $15. So, and the, you know, I can probably even get them for cheaper because I have ties with the AWRL. So. so if you could send me the link to the St. Charles Club, that might be more convenient for folks yeah. to travel all the way down. To yeah. The, uh, and there's a club in O'Fallon. There's a club in, I think, Great City. Or Warren, so yeah. they're, they're all over the place. I mean, I've, I've searched several clubs and asked about the license. And most of them go, well, we have a need. We'll get it. So it's really regular. Mm-hmm. Um, the regularness is what's nice about that location. Um, yeah. Otherwise, everyone has to commit. Everyone has to show up because they're putting on something special just for us. Yeah. And we have a, we have a problem with like people showing up. So, um, the randomness is, is good. Um, so the question is out there. If anyone like interested in leaving, I think I might want to take it. You know what you could probably do with him? What you do is just really we can throw it make it at, simple. At say and here, and download this file and study it, and come here on this day and fifteen bucks and take the test. Yeah, yeah, I don't have a problem doing that, and I can. I don't have a problem if, if uh, CJ wants to you know, file in um, or Midwest. I didn't. I didn't really publish this course out to the other ones because we were talking earlier. I didn't want to deal with the Facebook etiquette people and all that. But um, FCJ, I'm still trying to get a hold of with the CB, you know. <laughs> <laughs> still yelling out the window, huh? <laughs> We can we can put it out to the other clubs. I don't think there'd be a problem with that if we need to get people to attend. And, and that happens. So, so the question is, are you interested? And if you're interested, are you interested to do it on your own? And we all just pick a date and show up and do it together. Pick a date, you can just show up and do it. I'm good for that. A weekend. A weekend. Definitely a weekend. Definitely a weekend. Like weekend works for me, but I know some folks do work on the weekend. But weekend, I think it's good. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Having said that, I just want to not forget Sterling. So thank you, Sterling, for showing up. Yes. Thank uh, you. Thank you.